Okay, I think these were uh, three short and very snappy presentations. Thanks very much to Berkeley, uh, Jens, and, and Dean. Um, as I said before, rather than to let me speak, please seize the opportunity. Um, so who has questions for these panelists? There must be something. Um, I can't, in the back of the room and in front, maybe you start in the back. Can somebody bring a microphone, please? The gentleman there in the last row. Hi, my name is Jeremy Skinner from IID. I was very interested to hear everything that's being said, and I've learned probably more this afternoon than I've learned since Monday. Um, <laughs> but that probably reflects my my lack of knowledge of certain certain topics. And um, what struck me this week is that we're talking about water and food security. That agriculture consumes 70% of the world's water. But every time we have a panel or a meeting or a discussion about the private sector, it's all institutions. There is no private sector here that I can see that adequately represents the 70% of users of the world's water. So given what you've just said, you're beginning to get us into this whole private sector thing. You've talked about some of the service suppliers, some of the kit suppliers. There was mention of food companies filing returns. What would your advice be to the water sector, of which I'm more part, about how to go about engaging the private sector, whoever that is, that is using 70% of the world's water? How do we do it? To, and you're addressing that to whom? <laughs> Anybody sitting here. Okay. Do, you, do you want to take a team? <laughs> yeah. Um, well, I mean, <laughs> that's, that's a difficult question to address. Um, I don't know how many, how many uh, farmers there are in the world and, uh, and how many we can get into the, the world, the, 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 the Congress Center here. Um, I mean, I guess, I guess um, why UNIPFI focuses on this is because the financial sector uh, can be a driver of change. Um, other than that, I, I mean, I, f I find it myself difficult <laughs> to, to answer this question. Do you want to add anything, Dean? I'll just take a shot. Um, everyone from their economics class in high school or college remembers Malthus, yeah. uh, who said at one point in, in the 1700s, the Earth's population growth would outstrip the ability to feed itself. And there's been all kinds of progress in drought-resistant seeds, and, and uh, still there's the issue of wasted water uh, on open trench irrigation, and there's going to be another panel uh, on this, and so I don't want to steal any of their thunder. But from my standpoint in the equipment and services, I am seeing some fabulous innovation on companies in Israel who have drip irrigation where you can actually put salt water into the pipes and it leaches out fresh water in a very passive desalination. So there's technology advances, Monsanto with their drought resistant seeds, there's, there's uh, solutions through innovation to address this. Um, but you're right about, I don't see a big constituency on the farming community here. Probably one remark on that. Uh, we're sitting here on the financial sector panel, but also the link to the private sector is, I think, very strong because our leverage as a financial sector is very big. Because we're companies where we think that water is an issue and that their business uh, model is at risk for not uh, using the water in an appropriate way or that their business model does not reflect that. Uh, just we don't invest. So if they don't get changed, if they don't listen to us and we, we don't start discussions where we think we are satisfied with the answers and with the changes we see at the company, we are not investing in anything where we don't understand the risks and where we don't see a sustainable business model. So I think the dialogue is there between financial institutions and the private sector and changes are happening because of both sides are want to do changes. I might just quickly add that I think one of the reasons why there's a separate panel on agriculture and why we didn't bring it up or why many NGOs work exclusively on agriculture or don't talk about it much is 
There aren't very many industries that are 10,000 years old um, and that are truly global. And agriculture is different. And I don't say that as an excuse or as a, you know, I say it as a call to action, but I do think that is part of the reason why it's often dealt with separately. I also just wanted to, to distinguish quickly about consumptive water use. Most agriculture is not consumptive use. It does go back into the watershed, whether it's polluted, whether it, you know, there's sediment and nutrient issues, whether it's going back into the source from whence it came, those are all questions. But it is there just wanted to make that distinction between agriculture does not consume 70% of the, of the world's water. It's just withdrawals often, often go that direction. Thanks. The gentleman in the middle here. Um, and also please introduce yourself, uh, sir. Uh, Keith Weatherhead from Cranfield University in the United Kingdom. Uh, I guess worldwide everyone's now accepting we're seeing greater variability uh, in climate. Uh, and in Europe, it's pretty well embedded all the way across the political parties that this is human-induced. Uh, as I understand it, in America, it's not so uh, agreed by everyone. And, of course, your business response is very different, whether you consider this is a cyclical uh, change or a runaway human-induced uh, impact. I is the political uh, will in the U.S. affecting the way the business community uh, is reacting, or are you just ignoring or are you able to ignore that? Do you want to take that directly? Or do you think? You All right. Um, yeah, so I think from, from our perspective, certainly the lack of political will has impacts, but that has not stopped corporate action. And I think that's part of why the series corporate program and water work ha has had so much traction over the last few years and why we're focusing our resources there now, because there's serious leverage. and. Players in the business community see these risks, they feel these risks in their bottom line, or, or they're facing different regulatory schemes in a multinational supply chain or customer base. Um, so yeah, I mean, it definitely has an impact as regulation and, and political will always does on, on all things in a given place, but it, um, it hasn't stopped action in the private sector, which I think is rather telling that it is happening and it is real, regardless of what you know we're hearing on Fox News or, or from Florida this week. So you can't wish away climate change. Mm -hmm. um, the lady here. Thank you, uh, Ulrike Sapiro from Coca-Cola, um, one of the private companies that has been hanging around here um, all week, <laughs> and uh, um, yeah, with, with a minor. Um, connection to agriculture. But I have another question, which is, I, I can't quite reconcile the data that we've just heard from the, from the panel, which seem to suggest increasing and, and actually very dramatically growing interest of investors uh, into water and, and a lot of money behind this. I mean, I'm, I'm not good with numbers, but 50 what is trillion uh, dollars investment behind, behind investors interested in the CDP uh, water disclosure. Um, and I can't reconcile it with a comment from the gentleman at Bloomberg who said, well, actually, there is not a lot of knowledge around, uh, maybe in the financial sector, around water. So I'd like to understand how you see this, um, how you would assess your own, as a financial sector, your own understanding of water um, to the uh, detail, and, and where you go to get that knowledge, and what tools you would go back to to actually make do with it. I mean, not everywhere needs to have water experts, but, but you need to work with somebody, I suppose, to help you with that quickly clarify the CDP point and then, and then pass it on. But so the, those assets, those are from organizations that are signatories to the movement. So they've signed up and say, we, we want this information. We believe this is important. That doesn't mean they're directing, directing investment dollars based on any kind of water risk lens or you know index or anything along those lines. And I would say that that's, that's a lot of what we see in general. And I, I, heard, I heard someone else earlier this week say, oh, in our consulting business, water is key. We don't talk about it on the investment side within the same the same shop. Um, so I, th I think that that's part of the disconnect. And in terms of finding data and, and solutions, I'll pass that on. Yeah. I'm probably coming to your question about knowledge in the financial sector about water. I think you're right that the financial sector in the past, uh, the water knowledge was not very uh, common and not very common apart from the part of the sector investing in like water technologies, water works and so on, but see water as a more global transversal thing. And I think uh, companies or financial institutions like DEG, they're joining up, uh, teaming up with uh, other institutions who have more inside view, like DEG is teaming up with WWF in this issue and getting this inside knowledge from the last work in water from the last 20 years to, to be 
joined in that, and also on the practical assessment of individual water risk, coming, taking on to board uh, experts on the topic, hydrologists, to make really in-depth analysis on the sites, not staying like on a global uh, scale and, and looking, have a general look at it, but really have in-depth analysis with the individual company, and that's a really important thing. I'm probably part of my work. I'm in sustainability department. I mean, companies, financial institutions like the development banks are having big teams, which are not uh, economists, but engineers and, and have really knowledge about uh, water and other environmental topics. And that's, I think, an important thing financial institutions start to develop nowadays. Dean, any, any other comments? Yeah, that? this brought, was brought up earlier. I just wanted to um, emphasize the point that from the type of investors that we speak to, uh, there is a growing constituency, especially in Europe, of socially responsible investing, green funds, and dedicated water funds. So this week I met earlier with uh, three out of the four largest dedicated water funds in the world. Uh, and these are teams of analysts that are responsible for and have parameters of how they invest in companies that are exposed to the water sector. So there's a significant expertise. Uh, but also, they are also responsible for a return to their, uh, their investors. And so while there may be appeal, uh, long-term sustainability appeal about these investments, at the end of the day, they're measured on their returns and they must be investing in companies that will provide uh, a, a healthy return. Uh, it doesn't mean necessarily this quarter, but it has to be uh, broadly from the investors looking at this as a, providing an, a, an economic return, water versus energy versus infrastructure. They're all competing for investment dollars. Yeah, Gita? You know, you know there's, there's time for two more minutes. Yeah, sure. Just as um, you know, we had. Um, I said um, I'm, I understand what uh, Jens and uh, Dean were saying when being in the bank. Mm. Sorry, can you hear me better? Yep. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Um, I'm from Societe Generale, and we mm -hmm. we work uh, quite a lot with the uh, with your company, uh, your mm -hmm. institution, and uh, and city. And I just wanted to say that regarding knowledge. Um, you know, management and uh, using it uh, in terms of uh, uh, the financial sector supporting. The financial sector doesn't exist as, as such. It, it does that because it's, it's an intermediary in, in, the economic, in the economy of any country. And it, it works with, of course, corporates and also uh, other, other, other customers. And uh, uh, for instance, uh, one of the things that Jens mentioned, for instance, was uh, uh, the equator principles. Well, typically, um, when you look at the uh, IFC uh, performance standards, which are what, which is what the, the, the standards that usually are used by the EP equator principles financial institutions like uh, City, like um, uh, your company, uh, we. Um, we, we have uh, knowledge and we use, uh, for instance, when we have uh, uh, projects to invest, we use the uh, EHS guidelines and there's a whole bunch of uh, uh, information that are screened by, on the water itself, water impacts by the engineers, the environmentalists, either in-house or which are hired uh, by uh, as, as independent consultants to make sure that there's water use, that the, there's water impact control, uh, that there is um, you know, no damage for the environmental, et cetera. So these are things I think that are um, a part of what the, the banks now are, are taking into account for their own use and for their own business uh, activities and I think it's a very um, it's a step forward as just a link between the uh, private sector users and uh, the financial sectors. Yeah. And, and I don't think it's the Coca-Colas or SAB Millers of this world we have to educate. They are sparing partners for us. I mean it's smaller companies where we are struggling with. 
I don't think there's time anymore for questions. We are running 15 minutes late. So um, is there time now for a short break? Um, so in that case, I would suggest for you to, to seek up uh, one of the speakers. Thanks very much, uh, Dean Ray, uh, Berkeley Adrio, and Yanis Hunorov. Um, and um, back to Fred. Thanks. <laughs>